Father, we thank you for your love. I thank you how high, how wide, how deep is your love. I thank you that your word says that neither height nor depth, pestilence, famine, persecution, nothing can separate us from the love that you have for us. I thank you that like Paul, we can say that it is the love of God that has apprehended us, Lord. So we thank you for your love. We thank you that for God so loved that he gave his only begotten son. We thank you and we give you praise in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, worship team. <laughs> and the children are dismissed. But we are in our series, as the children are going downstairs, we are in our series titled Uncovering the Parables of Jesus. We're looking at seven parables that are found in Matthew chapter 13. Those seven are the parable of the sower, the parable of the wheat and tares, the parable of the mustard seed, parable of the leaven, the parable of the hidden treasure, the parable of the costly pearl, and the parable of the dragnet. They're called parables of the kingdom because Jesus starts off by saying the kingdom of heaven is like. These parables, as we saw, they not only give us insight on how the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is just simply the rule and the reign of God in our hearts. So when you say, so they not only give us insight in how the kingdom of God grows, they also give us insight in the work of the enemy, how the enemy works. If you remember the parable of the sower, the picture of the birds, some believe that's demonic activity, the work of the enemy. The Bible says that first, an individual hears the word, and as soon as that word is sown, the birds come and they cause a person to be inattentive, they cause a person to feel ill will towards the word of God or just simply to be ignorant of spiritual reality. They cannot grasp what's being said. If you remember the soils, the different soils. So one soil, it's just ignorance concerning spiritual reality. And another soil, they receive the word of God with joy, but the enemy comes and he attacks it with hard times and convinces an individual that holding on to the word of God is just too much trouble. A third soil, they hear the word of God, and the word has begun to take root, but the enemy comes and tells them, tells the lie that they are giving up too many good things. So it's this, it's this feeling or this belief that you're sacrificing, you feel like you're losing out on life, so the enemy comes with that lie. In the wheat and the tears, we're told that an enemy comes and he plants tears, and it paints the picture of the enemy, the devil, as a farmer that systematically begins to dig up those foundations, those roots. And how does it manifest in the church? People begin to leave the church, the faith, for a number of reasons because of these attacks. People leave the church because of offense. I looked up the number of the top five reasons why people leave the faith. One of them was because of offense. They got offended along the way, and that's an issue of roots. People leave the church, the faith, because of a lack of discipleship. Again, that's roots, that seed that was sown, and there just wasn't that root, that foundation. People leave the faith when there are unbiblical expectations. The Bible tells us, on one of the soils that when trials come for my name's sake, I am a Christian, but why am I going through difficult times? So people leave the faith because the full counsel of God is not preached. So unbiblical expectations. People leave the faith when politics and ideology are pushed over theology. That's the cares and the worries of this world make the word unproductive. And then people leave the faith because of a lack of connection. That's why we say that no one grows as an island. In Matthew 13, verse 44, we're invited into a private conversation. Jesus is talking to his disciples. The previous parables, he's been talking to the multitudes. 
And in this parable, the last three, he is talking to his disciples and also, he, obviously, he's talking to us. Matthew 13, verse 44, just one verse. And this is from the New King James Version. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and he sells all that he has and buys the fields. Some of the parables emphasize the future glory of the kingdom. The kingdom of God, like we said previously, is past, present, and future. This parable, that one verse, emphasizes the value of the kingdom presently, the present value of the kingdom. The scripture says that a man stumbles upon a treasure, and the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found. It's almost as if he's stumbling upon this treasure. He realizes the value of the treasure, is filled with joy, and then he goes and he buys, and he buys, he buys, he buys a field. Treasures were often hidden in fields because there were no formal banks. One commentary stated that in the East, men of wealth would divide their wealth into three categories. There would be wealth that was invested in trades, second, invested in jewels, and sometimes it was jewels that were put on an individual, and the remainder was buried in the earth. So when Jesus is saying that the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, He's not bringing about a new idea. It's something that the people were used to seeing. If you remember the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, we're told that the one with the one talent, in Matthew 25, verse 25, he says, and I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you, have, there you, there you can have what is yours. In the story of in Joshua, Joshua 7, verse 21, Achan steals some plunder. And verse 21, Joshua 7, verse 21, he says, When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from uh, Babylon, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. Proverbs 2, verse 4. The writer is encouraging us to seek wisdom, and he says, If you seek for her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures... So this was something that was common. He says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid again. Out of joy, he went and sold all that he had purchased. You almost get the picture that the land obviously was not his. So he finds treasure, hides that treasure, and then he goes, earns some money, and then he buys the field. The whole purpose is so that he can own that treasure. Treasure refers to two things. Treasure refers first to the place where goods and precious things are stored for safekeeping, for safekeeping, like a deposit, a treasure chest. Treasure also refers to anything that we deem as precious. Jesus, one of the challenges with this parable is that Jesus does not explain this parable. He does not tell us what the field represents. He does not tell us uh, who the man is. So there have been different interpretations. Some see the treasure as the church. Some see the treasure as Israel. But what we're going to do is we're going to take an overview and highlight the things that are obvious from that verse. Four simple points that we're going to go over. The kingdom of God is a treasure. That's obvious from that verse. The kingdom of God is a treasure. The kingdom of God is not obvious to everyone. The Bible tells us that it was hidden. Discovery of the kingdom of God produces joy, and the kingdom of God requires sacrifice. He went and sold all that he had so that he could purchase that field and own that treasure. The kingdom of God is a treasure. When I phrased it as the kingdom of God, when I, trace, when I phrased it as the kingdom of God is a treasure, it was easy to detach from any form of responsibility. You know, the kingdom of God is a treasure. We can all agree. But if you phrase it and say that the rule and the reign of God in your heart is valuable, that's what he's saying. 
the rule and the reign of God in your heart is a treasure that kind of muddies up the water. We're saying that more than anything else, the rule and the reign of God, I see the rule and the reign of God as being more valuable than treasure. Psalm 73, verse 25. The psalmist said, Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire beside you. Your relationship with God, the rule and the reign of God in your heart is more valuable than anything that you're praying for, is more valuable than any earthly possession. The rule, the kingdom of God is a treasure. The rule and the reign of God is a treasure. The treasure has present day value. The treasure has present day value. The value is based on who Christ is, what he has done, and what he offers. The kingdom of God, the rule and the reign of God, the little prompting, the voice of the Holy Spirit, the word of God that God quickens in your spirit, you are saying that that quickening of the Holy Spirit, the word of God, is more valuable than any earthly treasure. The value comes based on what Christ, who Christ is, what Christ has done, and what he offers. In Colossians 2, verse 3, the Bible says, In whom are hidden all the treasures in Christ, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Our relationship with Jesus is a continuous rediscovering. It's like stumbling onto more treasure, stumbling onto more hidden treasure. So the kingdom of God is a treasure. The treasure is because of also the surpassing value of our salvation. In Colossians 3, verses 3 to 4, the Bible says, For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. The kingdom, the reign, the rule and the reign of God. Making Christ ultimate in your life, you're saying that it is a treasure. It is to say, I heard one person say, it is to say that if none of your prayer requests were answered right now, you would be content because you have this treasure, your relationship with Jesus Christ. If he never gave you that car, never got that promotion, you never got healed, you are content because the rule and the reign of Christ in your heart is a treasure. As I was pondering on that point, I had to ask, is there anything I value more than obedience to Christ? What is most important to me? My spouse, my family, my children, my money, hobbies, sports, reputation, self-comfort, pleasure. Paul made a statement. He said, for me to live is Christ and for me to die is gain. If that is the ideal, let's say that's a 10 on that scale. Paul saying, for me to live is Christ, for me to die is gain. He's saying that the kingdom of God is valuable. The rule and the reign of God is a treasure. If that is the ideal, the 10, I, have to, I had to look back and I realized that in my spiritual walk at different seasons, there were times when I was a two, on a three, on a four. Because if I, if I took an honest look at myself, I would have told you that the kingdom of God, I did not see the rule and the reign of God as the ultimate treasure in my life. So the first point that we see here is that the rule and the reign of Christ in your heart is valuable. The second point that we get from this parable is that the kingdom of God is not obvious to everyone. We're told that the treasure was hidden in a field. So many walked past that field. The treasure was hidden in a field. Now here Jesus is talking to believers, but we understand that the rule and the reign of God for unbelievers, the Bible tells us that the gospel is veiled. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, the Bible says that the God of this age has blinded the minds of those, has blinded their minds so that they do not believe. It is veiled, hidden, because people refuse to see the key. That's Romans 10 verse 9. If you declare 
with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It is veiled because people refuse, some unbelievers refuse to see Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus says that I am the good shepherd, I am the gate, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. John 1.10 says that he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. This is for the unbeliever. For the believers, there are certain treasures that we have in our walk with God that are hidden. Isaiah 45 verse 3 says that I will give you treasures of darkness. These are spiritual treasures that we don't, that we don't appropriate because often that treasure is not evident with the natural eye. The Bible says that the things of the spirit are foolish to the carnal mind. Sometimes the treasure requires a little digging. The treasure requires a little discomfort. The treasure is covered in dirt. A few examples of things that are treasures in our relationship with God. The word of God is a treasure. In Acts 17, verse 11, the Bible says, Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see, to see if the things that were preached were so. In Luke 24, two disciples are walking down a road. They are disappointed. And the Bible says that Jesus came. And from the Old Testament, from the scriptures, he began to explain that the scriptures pointed to him. He began to reveal the treasure that was in the scripture. Paul told Timothy, you have known the scriptures that are able to make you wise. And the psalmist said, Thy word have I hid in my heart. The word of God is a treasure. I've discovered that from Genesis to Revelation, if you read the Bible, sometimes you have to take a step back. Sometimes you have to dig a little deeper. But from Genesis to Revelation, it all talks about Jesus. It leads to Jesus in one form or another. You will find Jesus right from Genesis right down to the book of Revelation. Just in the book of Matthew, Matthew tells us that he is the Messiah. Matthew tells us that he is the Messiah, the King of the Jews. Mark talks about, Mark talks about how he is a miracle worker. Luke describes him as the Son of Man. In the book of Acts, when you're reading about how the, whole, how the disciples did things inspired, moved by the Holy Spirit, if you take a step back, you will see that Jesus is now the ascended Lord. You will see when you read about the Holy Spirit, you will see that Jesus is the Holy Spirit. You will see that as they go from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, he is saying that he is the Savior of the world, but it's hidden in that book. In First and Second Corinthians, when Paul is talking about all the mess in the church, about wrong relationships, if you take a step back, you will see that he is saying that Jesus is the sanctifier. There is a call to a sanctified life. If you read the book of Galatians, when Paul is talking about how we have been redeemed from the law, he is saying that, hey, listen, Jesus has redeemed us. He is our liberty. Romans, he is our justifier. In Ephesians, he says that he is the Christ of unsearchable riches. But in every book, there is this treasure. And we have to dig a little to see the treasure that we have in the word of God. One author said that Jesus is bread to a starving land. He is like water in a dry land. He is the doctor in a sick room. He is the lawyer that comes in a courtroom. And he is your advocate. If you read the Bible, when you read about how Abel made a sacrifice... That sacrifice is pointing to the perfect sacrifice that will come. When you read about Noah and you see the rainbow and you, and you look at children's books and there's a picture of that rainbow, it's a reminder that he is a covenant-keeping God and that he has, a covenant, he has a covenant with you, but it's hidden in the scriptures. You read about Abraham going to sacrifice Isaac and there's a ram caught in a thicket. 
It's God saying that the, he has made provision for our sins. It's pointing to the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It's pointing to the time when John the Baptist will say, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. You read about Isaac digging up a well. It gives us, it lets us know that Jesus is the living water. John chapter 4, when he talks to the woman by the well in Samaria, he says, If you drink of this living water, you will never thirst again. You read about Jacob sleeping and there's a ladder descending. There's a ladder with animals ascending and descending. He is saying that there is no other way to heaven except through Jesus Christ. You cannot be saved except by accepting Jesus Christ. You read about Elijah and his mantle. It's a picture of Jesus and Jesus saying that as you go about and do the Great Commission, I am with you. Even unto the end of the world, Elisha's staff, uh, Samuel's horn of oil. When you read about the rod that Moses had, there is no power in that rod. The power is in the word behind that rod. And Jesus tells us that he is the word. And the word became flesh. Everything is being upheld by the word. You read, Matthew, you, you read about Peter's shadow. He is Peter's shadow that is bringing about healing. He is Paul's handkerchief and apron. He is Stephen's signs and wonders. He is John's pearly city. But when you have to take that step back and see the treasure that is in the word of God, but often we miss the treasure that is in the word of God. The Bible also tells us that trials are a hidden treasure. James comes along and he says, for the believer... You might not see it, but trials are a hidden treasure. Trials, he calls them a pearl. They produce a pearl of patience. They purify our faith. They are a treasure in that if it's not God sent, it's God used. Not God sent, if, even if the devil causes the trial, it will always be God used. It's Romans 8, all things work together for the good for those that are called according to his purpose. So for a believer, trials, difficult situations, they are a hidden treasure. Service is a treasure. Hebrews 6 verse 10, the Bible says that God will not forget your work and the love you have shown for his name when you've served the saints. When you do little things in God's name, you gave someone water, visited people. Acts chapter 10, what's so special about Cornelius? The Bible says that his prayer and his giving to the poor, his prayer and his love for the poor had risen up as a sweet aroma before God. Tabitha, what is so special about Tabitha? She made clothes for poor widows. Service is a treasure. The condition of our hearts is a treasure. Matthew 12 verse 35 the Bible says that a good man out of the treasure of his heart brings forth good things. The condition of your heart is a treasure. The fear of the Lord is a treasure. Isaiah 33 verse 6. This is saying that what you know about God is not all that there is to know. The fellowship that you've experienced, the forgiveness that you've experienced, the presence of God that you know. It's saying that what you know, what you know about God is not all that there is to experience. The presence, the love that you have felt, the love that drew you to him, there is more. There are hidden treasures in your walk with God. I heard the story of a man who from England wanted to, from Eng, I think from England, he wanted to sell to America. Worked, saved a lot of money bought his ticket, and started that journey to America, sailing a journey that would have taken three to four weeks. And it said that every time that it was mealtime, they would see this man withdraw and either go into his cabin or just withdraw to a corner. Every time it was mealtime, this man would withdraw until three quarters of the journey, one passenger went up to him and said, I've noticed that every time that it's mealtime, you have a tendency of withdrawing from people, withdrawing from the crowd. Why? And the man said, well, I only had enough money for the ticket and not enough for the meals. And the passenger said that your ticket allows you, gives you access to every meal. And I am saying that sometimes as Christians, 
We think that we just have a ticket to heaven, but there are these things that God has given us access to. There's a fellowship that God wants us to experience. So we have this treasure. And then third point, the discovery of the kingdom of God produces joy. Discovery of the kingdom of God produces joy. Romans 14, verse 17. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. We're told that this man, when he discovered the treasure with joy, he was filled with joy. Joy comes from three things. Joy comes from knowing God, abiding in Christ, and obeying God. Joy comes from knowing him, abiding in him, and obeying God. There is no joy when you're out of alignment. That's why the Bible constantly tells us, confess your sins so that you can come into that fellowship. If you just remember Adam and Eve. So discovery of the kingdom of God produces joy. The fourth point is that the kingdom of God requires sacrifice. The man sold all that he had. Jim Elliot made a statement. He said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. This parable also looks at salvation from a human perspective. You, there's this, what looks like an accidental discovery, but we know that no one just stumbles into salvation. The Holy Spirit was working. But it highlights how the Bible tells us how we all like sheep have gone astray. In Matthew 18 verse 12, the parable of the lost sheep, how the shepherd goes after the lost sheep. If you remember the story, by, the story of the woman by the well in Samaria, she went to get some water. She's not looking, uh, she, she's not going to the temple. She just simply wanted water. What she did not know was that God had been working, the grace of God, the spirit of God had been working in her life. She encounters Christ and then she comes face to face with the truth. And we're told that she left that water, went back into the village, and she said, come meet a man that told me all that I ever did. You read about Paul. Paul is out to persecute the church, and then he has an encounter with Jesus. And in the same way, some of us were going our own way, but it's the love of God that apprehended us. So there is God working in our hearts when we are, when we are prone to stray. There's also a transaction that takes place when the man discovers the value of the, treasure, of the treasure. He goes and he buys the field, sells everything that he has and buys the field. Reminds me of the song, trading my sorrows, trading my shame, trading my guilt for the joy of the Lord. When you become a Christian, there are spiritual transactions. Some of us fall short, we find this treasure but we never move on to these spiritual transactions. They're not transactions for the sake of salvation, but because of salvation, I lay down my guilt, I lay down my pride, I lay down my shame, I lay down that condemnation for what Christ has accomplished for me. And then the kingdom of God is worth everything we have and everything that we are. To enjoy the kingdom, we must accept all that comes with it, the field in that parable cost the man everything that he owned. It represents the losses, the hardship, the persecution, and just the persecution of being a follower of Jesus Christ. I heard the story of a man by the name of Horatio Spafford. Horatio was married to Anna Spafford. They had five children, four daughters and one son. His first son, his son, died in 1870 at the age of four when the son developed, suddenly developed scarlet fever and suddenly died at the age of four. A year later, October 1871, Horatio Spafford, who had invested in a lot of property in downtown Chicago, lost the majority of his wealth because of the Chicago fires. Those fires, in those fires, 300 people, 300 people died, left close to 100,000 people homeless. 1870, he loses his four-year-old son. 1871, he loses his wealth. Two years later, 18, about 1873, 
trying to cope with the loss of his wealth and the loss of his son, he turned to his family and he said, maybe we need a change of scenario. So they planned to travel from America. They, tra they planned to travel to England. Horatio Spafford was friends with D.L. Moody, and on the itinerary was a plan to attend the fall revival and to visit D.L. Moody. But just before they left, Horatio Spafford had some legal appointments and legal things that he had to take care of. So he took his family, his wife, Anna, and his four daughters to the shipyard. And he kissed his wife, Anna. The plan was for him to join the family a few days later on. He kissed his wife, Anna, kissed his 12-year-old Annie, kissed his 7-year-old Maggie, 4-year-old Bessie, and 18-month-old Tanetta. As the ship sailed, it said that as there were three quarters on their journey on the Atlantic, a British ship carrying some steel collided with the ship that his wife and other passengers were in, and that ship immediately sank. They say that within the first 15 or 20 minutes, that ship had sunk. Miraculously, his wife was found just floating on a plank of wood, unconscious. They rescued her and took her to South Wales. When she got to South Wales, she sent a telegram which just contains, which contains these words. She said, she sent a telegram to Horatio and she said, saved alone. All of our children are gone. Horatio Spafford booked the next ship so that he could go and comfort his wife. As they were traveling on the Atlantic, the captain of that ship summoned for Horatio, called him to the bridge, and he said, about our charts tell us that around this spot, this is where the accident took place. This is where your family perished. And Horatio stood took it all in, looked at the waves, looked at the depth of the sea, perhaps the wind blowing in his face, took it all in, and then he withdrew to his cabin. And when he withdrew to his cabin, they say that he took out a pen and wrote these words. When peace like a river attended my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. They say that they went on to have three other children, and, and he had a son with his wife. That son, he called Horatio Jr., named him after the previous son. That son also passed away. But they say that through it all, he never wavered in his faith. Through it all, he held on through the trials and through the pain because he believed that he had a treasure of unsearchable riches. He believed that his relationship with God was of unsurpassing value. You cannot put a monetary value on your relationship with Jesus Christ. It takes a person that understands the value of the relationship with Christ to hold on through difficult situations. Closing points, cl closing remarks concerning this treasure. They say that he that hath much earthly treasure commonly thinks about this treasure. It's his chief delight. And in the same way, he that sees Christ as a treasure frequently thinks about Christ, and Christ is his chief delight. Earthly treasure is supposed to make a person feel safe and secure. It's supposed that we say that it's supposed to make them rich. He that has Christ is rich. What does it benefit to gain the whole world but forfeit your soul? They say that people who have much earthly riches live different lives. They eat differently. They dress differently. They are not, they are not concerned by some of the problems that the poor have. Though they are not affected by some of the problems at a certain level. And in the same way, he that has Christ feeds differently. There's certain things that are not meant to consume our care and concern. That's why he said, do not be anxious for anything but in everything, because we have this treasure in earthen vessels. A man that has much earthly treasure can do a lot of good to his neighbor, more than others can do. A person who is rich in faith, rich in promise, rich in experience, can do a lot of good for others. Your relationship with God is of value.
your relationship with God is of value. You have hidden treasure. That treasure produces joy, but it will cost you all that you are and all that you have. Amen. I was going to ask. I wasn't sure if the worship was coming. <laughs> Thank you.